the link where I have my um Instagram on, that's an iPhone. I hate the iPhone. Okay, fair enough. Fair this enough. is a Anyone? droid. I've got, I've got to introduce us. I'm back again. It's Abs of October Red. It's a live debate. It's part two. And I've got with me no other than Hall of Famer, two-weight world champion who had 80 professional <laughs> fights in his career. I cannot believe 80 fights. No other than Body. In fact, James Body McGirt. <laughs> Let's get it right. James Body, welcome. Thank you. How you doing? Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. So thank you so much for coming on. Um, obviously, we've got, to, we've got to talk because Callum Smith goes up against Viterbiev. <laughs> I know you're over there. You're in Canada now, right? Yes. It's cold, snowing, everything. When we got here, it was, it was when we got here, it was minus 12. Oh my gosh. Yeah. How's Callum acclimatizing to that? Because that, I mean, the UK is cold, but not on that level. Nothing like that. Nah. I mean, we stay in. We're not fighting outside, so we're okay. Yeah, <laughs> I get that. I get that. Body, I've been thinking, and I'm a massive Baturbia fan. I am self confessed. I've always liked Baturbia style. Um, but for the past few days, I've been watching Callum under yourself, under your. Uh, tutelage. I've been watching some of the training videos that you've been putting up. I've watched his uh, Baturbiev's last fight uh, with Anthony Yard and I saw some things and I'm picturing them with the stuff that you're putting up that I think Callum can capitalize on to probably get that knockout himself. I don't usually sway like that because I'm usually right. solid 100% Arta Baturbiev. He beats everybody, blah, blah, blah. But I sat back and I thought, there's something different here. Talk to us a little bit about your training with Callum. I mean, listen, I mean, we prepare for this fight. I don't know, honestly, like, we prepare for anybody else. But, you know, we know what we have in front of us. And we know that we have to get his respect. You know, a guy like Better Be Ever, you got to get his respect. If you don't get his respect, he's going to walk right through you. So we got to get his respect. So... You, you got to be able to uh, touch him with something and let him know that there's danger ahead if he steps up. Somebody like uh, Baturbiev, you know, is known to come on the inside um, to start to – he almost, like, looks for spots that he can hit you. He looks for yes. you. You know, when you hear a coach say, find the angles, that's what Baturbiev seems to do on the inside. He's very good so at it. Very good at it. He's very good at it. You know what I mean? He's very good uh, inside. He's very he's dangerous either way, inside or outside. So the key is to make him uncomfortable inside as well as outside. Because if he finds a comfort zone, then you got trouble. So we got to make him uncomfortable all night. And that's the key. You know, we got to be you anybody, not just Callum, anybody that fights him. A guy like him, you got to make him uncomfortable all night. Because once he gets comfortable, he's going to put his foot on the gas and run you over. Looking at his fights that he's had before, because all of his fights, Arta's fights, have been stoppages. They don't go the distance. How do you make somebody like that respect you? And I'm talking to you as a former fighter, a former world champion. How do you do that? Well, when you get inside and you touch them with something, and they say, oh, shit, this hurts. See, he's never had no one to really touch on anything that'll make him say, let me back up a little bit. I mean, not taking nothing away from him. I know it's a hell of a challenge we have before us, but I, don't, I personally think that most of the guys that fought him really fought to survive. They didn't, you know, what I'm, you know what I'm saying? You know, they was fight to try to get a points win over him. You're not going to get a points win over him if you don't respect you because he, he gets stronger and stronger as the fight goes on. You know what I mean? And most guys try to, you know, they fight to try to keep him off of them. You know what I mean? That's they do. You know, we got to keep him off of us so he don't hurt us. And he eventually catches up to them because they don't sit down and say, look, I got to show this mamma jamma that, you know, it's not going to be an easy task. You know I mean, so, you know, we, we, we know that Callum knows that, but at the same time, we got to get his respect right from the beginning. We got to get it. First time we touch him, you got to touch him with something good. If not, you're in trouble. 
Yeah, because yeah, like, yeah, like I said, and he does, he does seem to grow through the rounds because watching his last fight with Anthony Yard, Anthony Yard did quite well to start off with. He did, and I thought, oh, okay. But as the rounds went on, we saw he was almost like downloading the information from Yard to wait for right. that opportunity to kind of come in and and you know pick his shots and and pick meaningful, hurtful shots. He, he makes he every has- shot count. He makes every shot count. And that's what we got to do. We got to make every shot count. We hear that quite often, you know, fight fire with fire. It's something that I believe Joseph Parker said when he was going in to fight Deontay Wilder recently, that they use the words fight fire with fire. Sometimes people run from that idea and think, well, no, you need something to quench the fire, fight it with water, fight it with something else, but not fire. But you keep you the water on reserve. You keep the water on reserve in case you need it. You know what I mean? But just going out there trying to sprinkle water along, sometimes they're going to cut the mustard. We see Callum's uh, shape. I've been watching his training videos with yourself, showing, you know, tiny bits of pad work, nothing to give too much away. I've listened to one of Callum's recent interviews and the respect that he has for you as a coach. He even... He called you the boss. Talk to us about that relationship that you've got with Callum because he really does show you respect as a trainer. Well, Callum's a good guy, you know. Um, and what I like about him is that he listens, but at the same time, he asks questions. You know what I mean? And, and, I, and I tell him like I tell any fighter, you don't have to do it the same way I do it. I don't expect you to do it the same way. The key is to get the same result at the end of the day. So you got to do it the way I'm showing you. You got to fit it into where you're comfortable doing it. You know what I mean? And uh, so, and he does that. And I mean, you know, we we talk every day. You know what I mean? Uh, he doesn't talk much, but when I do get something out of him, you know what I mean? It's a lot. You know, because he's really quiet. He don't he don't say much. He could be in the room. You don't even know he's there. You know what I mean? He's very quiet. But but he's a good student. Very good student. His shape, his composure seems to have adjusted since he's gone with yourself as well. I'm seeing, you know, probably a more compact, even a certain stance that he was with, you could see that it's literally ready for that toe-to-toe action. You know when you used to get those old boxing uh, photographs where they stand in a certain, like, traditional stance, not now where everyone's flexing their muscles and doing that, but the (laughs) old school. He seemed to have that old school stance. Talk to us about how you've evolved him as a fighter because he's got it in him. He's a good boxer. We know that. But you, you've evolved him as a fighter. Well, you know, a guy like Callum, he's the type of guy that, okay, you telling me this, show me this, show me it, and see how I can get results with it. Now, we'll try something. It might not work the first time we, we work on it. It might not work the fourth or fifth time. But... Within a week or two, he's got it. And then when he has it, like he'll throw a combination. When he's got it right, he'll just look at me and say, he'll nod his head like, that's it. You know what I mean? Because, you know, sometimes, you know, he goes back to his old habits. It's normal. You know what I mean? But, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to change a lot. Just simple stuff. Nothing major. And uh, he gets it. You know what I mean? And once he gets it, he'll keep doing it. Once he gets comfortable with it, I got to stop him and say, okay, enough. Let's try something else now. <laughs> you know, when you're in the ring then, buddy, and you've got to listen to those commands when you come back in the corner, and, and this is just me thinking about it because, like, like I said, he's spent time with a previous trainer, and sometimes we can see fighters revert to type. They've got a type. How do you then, like, instill that? Like I said, you seem to be doing the drills and the repetitions till he's got it and you've got to move on. But say, say for, for example, something sticky happens in the ring and then he reverts back to, how do you then switch him back on to say, remember what I said, we've got to stick to this plan that we've constructed over the past how many, well, it seems like about a year now. <laughs> okay, it's, it's two things. One, the fighter has to trust you. He's got to trust what you say. You know what I mean? And you got to show him if he trusts you, it's going to work. And another thing is, you got to know your fighter. Not just as a fighter, 
But as an individual, as a person, you know, when you're spending time with him, laughing and joking, you got to watch him and study him, watch his body language, watch what triggers him, what don't trigger him. You know, fighters, you know, there's more to it than just going in the gym with a guy saying, okay, we're ready. No, as a, to me, I, you know, I can't speak for anybody else. But to me, I've learned, you know, from my experiences that you have to get to know the fighter. You know, the fighter has to be able to trust you because when they come back to that corner, you know, it's like a kid coming back looking at his father like, your dad, what's happening? And if you don't have the answers, then what are you going to do? So you got to be able to have that confidence in each other and know each other very well. How long would so you, you say? Gotta, Sorry, you know what I mean, I study him. Even when we're in the car, like I say things just to see his reaction to certain things. You know what I mean? And then you know how you can approach the guy. You know, some guys you can yell at, some guys you can't. Some guys you can curse at, some guys you can't. You know, you can't be the same way with each fighter. So because they respond that, differently. So have you uh, had that different kind of corner mentality with different fighters where some of them you can literally cuss them out if they're on the stool and then some of right. them you, you may need to apply that there, there, cream. So have you got that dynamic, I can switch to whatever you have to. I've got? Yeah, yeah, you have to. Be, you have to be able to do it, but it doesn't happen that night. It has to start in the gym when you're with the fighter every day, four, five, six weeks. You're with him every day. You study him, you study his body language. You can tell... That when he's shadow boxing, if he's you can tell sometimes by a shadow boxing if he's gonna have a good day in sparring that day, just by his body language. You know, you have to watch him every day. You know, their the demeanor, it's it's a lot of work. And a lot of people, you know, I mean, I mean, I can't speak for anybody else, but for me, it's a lot of work, but I enjoy it because I love using my mind. So I love like sitting there studying the person, figuring out, okay, now can he do this? No, he can't do that. Well, let me try. He can do that. And then I say, I try this. And then sometimes he'll look at me like, just try it. You know what I mean? And then, like I say, once he tries it and he's successful with it, I have to tell him, okay, we got to try another move now because he'll go crazy with that move. So it's, it's, it's a lot of work. You know, if you love your job, you know what I mean? It's just not, it's not just about getting the fighter ready. So, okay, go in there and get him. Nah, man, it's a lot, especially with a fight of this magnitude. You know, you got to, it's it's a lot. It's a lot, you know what I mean? After a fight, any big fight, any trainer that's not mentally drained, there's something wrong. Because mentally, you know, once the fight's over and you won, or whatever the case may be, mentally you're just tired because you put so much into it. Like the closer it gets to the fight, the fighters' demeanor change. You know, some fighters want you near them. Some fighters want you, even though you're the trainer, some might want you near them. Some might want you at a distance, but just knowing that you're there. You don't got to be up their butt, but they just need to know if they say, coach, you say, yo, I'm right here. I mean, that's how Antonio Tarver was. I don't have, he didn't want me under him, but he wanted me in that room somewhere. We can say, buddy, and I'd be like, I'm right here. And same with Callum. You know I mean, he won't call me. He'll just look around. You know I mean, He'll, he won't say, where you at, coach? He just looks around the room. And we'll make eye contact, and we know everything is cool. Because he don't like you all up on him. He, he, you know what I mean? But as long as he knows that you're in that room, you know what I mean? He's good. That's interesting to know. I'm going to go into the chat. Um, uh, forgive my manners. Uh, good evening to everybody that's here with us. It's obviously Buddy McGirt, Hall of Famer, Callum Smith's trainer, as he goes into this massive magnificent light heavyweight bout with the world champion Arta Baterbia coming this weekend. Bodies out there in Canada, they're, they're bedding in to the cold temperatures out there. And I thought, why not? Let's just have a catch up. But we're going to go into the chat. Metalbox J, good evening. Has body seen Callum Johnson put Baterbia down? No, no. You know what? I haven't seen it. I heard about it, but I haven't seen it. Yeah. Uh, another question. Oh, good evening, Toby. Toby likes his ring girls, and I'm never going to forget that. So good evening to you, Toby. Uh, evening. This is from Cornell. Does Callum not fighting since August 2022 cause any worries? No. I mean, you can't. It, it'll cause worry if you think about it. You just you can't think about it. You just got to say, okay, we didn't fight. I believe everything, ha everything happens for a reason. You know what I mean? So... We can't focus on that. You know, um, it gave us more time to really, really prepare for different stuff. 
that's how I look at it. Yeah, you've got you've got to look at it as a every cloud has got a silver lining. You mentioned there that you know Callum's the reserve type, but even though he's quiet and he's reserved, you've still got to learn him as a fighter, and hence he's got a bed in with you as a coach. You mentioned things, you know, like trust, you know, be able be able to obviously take each other's word for it. How long would you say? Because I, like I said, I'm someone that always gets nervous when a fighter moves from coach to coach. It's not right. something I'm a fan of because I don't know. Maybe I just like to see the relationship grow. If something's not necessarily broke, that's the way it used to be. That's the way it used to be back in the day. It used to be if you lost a fight, you didn't leave your coach. It wasn't your coach's fault. You know what I mean? It's you and your coach. It's it's a, the, you and your coach go back to the drawing board. When you was winning, everything was fine. But now you lose, you say, oh, I lost because of him. No, he wasn't in there fighting. You were in there fighting. You know what I mean? So, and, you know what I mean? That's why I just don't get it today. I mean, tr fighters today jump. They jump around, man. It's it's crazy. But, hey, it is what it is, you know? Why do you think it's so easy nowadays to do that jumping around it instead of having, you know, because, you know, Callum's left his coach to come to you. We've seen the same with Dan Aziz. We've seen the same with Dillian White. What is it that makes a fighter these days say, you know what, I think I'm going to go over there. What is it? What is it that makes that's it so a, easy nowadays? If I can answer that question, I can pick the six numbers to Lotto. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. They're I mean, I really, I really don't know. I, I, I don't know. I can't answer that. I really don't know. So with the relationship that you've got with Callum, like I said, he's got that massive respect for you. You look at this fight, it's a big, it's a big challenge for Callum, but there's always that pressure on the coach as well. Like you said, these days, it's social media. We all like to point the fingers at somebody if it doesn't go our way. You're a coach, an experienced fighter, an experienced coach but you still manage to play a low profile, even after, you know, such accolades in boxing. How do you do that? And why do you do that? Because you could be singing and tap dancing and doing all sorts of stuff if you wanted to be. <laughs> you know, um, I saw I saw a little, I saw, God bless him, Bernie Mac. I oh, saw yeah, an God rest his soul. I saw an interview with him and it really, it really touched me. And he said that he's not in competition with nobody. He's out there to do his best and do his best for himself. You can't ask for more than that in, in a person. You know what I mean, when you're in competition with people, it's just it's too much, too much, too much drama. Well, you go out there and you do your best, and you know within yourself you did your best. That's all that matters. Because no matter what you do and how you do it, win, lose, or draw. You're always going to have your critics. No matter what, you're always going to have your critics. So if you're going to go through life worrying about critics, you're going to be a miserable person. You know what I mean? I mean, I've had people say a lot of it. I just, I don't even, you know, some people send me comments. You know what I mean? I had a guy send me a comment on Instagram saying that I was a racist against Russian fighters. Where did you get that from? I, you know what I did? I didn't even, I didn't even respond. I just blocked him. I mean, I, I'm not going to. I just said, Delete block. That's it. I'm not going to get into all this. I mean, it's, it's it's crazy, but you know, people. You know, I don't understand. You know, but you know, Mike Tyson said it best. Everybody's tough on social media. You know what I mean? You know what I mean, they might say something bad about you. You don't know who they are, but then when they see you, they're the first person to ask you for a picture and autograph. Yeah, that's a strange thing. So I don't get into those disputes with people. People always say things. You know, like one time I, I had a, I forgot. Um, I was doing myths with somebody and I posted it and somebody had a small remark, you know, and I'm saying to myself, I couldn't respond, but why? I know what I did was good today. The fighter was happy. That's all that matters. What a person thinks about me or says about me, listen, I'm going to be, good Lord willing, I'm going to be 60 years old on the 17th. You know what I mean? I don't give a damn what anybody says about me. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't, I don't even stress it, baby. I don't, I don't stress it. If you don't already, you need to follow Buddy McGirt's social media on uh, Instagram. It is as it is. Uh, he really puts up. What I like about your page is the quotes that you put up because a lot of them do resonate um, quite deeply with myself. And, you know, some of the quotes are, 
your quotes, and this is where I know a lot of life experience comes into it because it's almost like all of them insinuate or tell a story that you've been betrayed many of times. You oh, can very. see that. But I mean, if you can talk about it or if you can give us, and I'm not that much younger than you, so if you can give <laughs> us some advice. I'm, I'm catching you up, buddy. I'm catching you up. You know, 50, 50 is getting nearer to me, so I'm catching right. you up. An experience that you had with somebody that you trusted, maybe in business, maybe, yeah, we'll keep it to boxing and a, and a massive lesson that you learned from that person, that person's betrayal. Uh, well, he's deceased now, but I got to say my manager. God bless him. May he rest in peace. But uh, when, it, when, when push came to shove, you know what I mean? He looked at, he, he didn't have my back after 15 years. 15. What happened? 15 years. Uh, I had a lawsuit against the doctor with my shoulder. Okay. And all he had to do was go in court and tell the truth. And I would have been a multimillionaire. But he went in court and took the doctor's side. Why? Yeah. I guess he didn't want me to get that. I guess he didn't want me to get that, that that money from the lawsuit. But my lawyer called me and says, I thought you said this man was your friend. I said, he is. He said, he buried you in that. Oh. He said he went 1,000% against you in that. He took the doctor's side all the way. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, no way. He goes, I'm telling you, buddy. He went against you. Because the lawyer took the case on contingency, you know, like hopefully I get, and he worked on it for like two years, the lawyer. Like he worked on this case for two years. And he called me that morning and says, if your manager tells the truth, you'd be a rich man. Because these people are ready to settle. My manager went in there. He went in there and I couldn't believe it when the, when the lawyer called me. Did you yeah, speak baby. about it? Nah, for what? Speak to what, what? What? What could he possibly tell me? Why he did it? Did he ever speak to you? Did he ever apologize? Did you ever have nah. that conversation? Not at all. He was just left. That was it. Was you still in contract with him? No, I wasn't fighting anymore. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fifteen so years. That, that, that that was that was like that was a shocker for me. I mean, I'm like I've been with this mother skunk for 15 years. I mean, and bam, he does that to me. Instead of saying I'm gonna stick by my fighter, let him get this money, and ride off into the sunset, and do that. Yeah. A couple of people in the comments are t literally typing what I'm thinking, which is, it sounds like he took a payment. Sounds like he might have been, you know, when they say somebody's ready to settle, that company might have got to him and said, I'll tell you what, we'll give you a certain amount, just blah. You know, you know what it's like. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Without a doubt. So, you know, I mean, it, uh, you know, it, it was, it was like, I can't, I'm at a, I'm still, when I talk about it now, I'm still shocked. All you know right. I mean? Yeah, I, uh, and boxing is probably like I said, it fighting in the ring is is not the problem. It's everything that goes on outside of the ring. With the amount of yeah. fighters that you've trained, what was? And I've got to ask this because it's probably one of my favorite trilogies that I've watched. What was Gatti like, or two year old Gatti? You know, uh, he was a great guy. Um, hard work, a lot of fun. And then uh, I don't know what happened after the Mayweather fight. He became a totally different person. In what way? Uh, just everything, you know. We parted ways. Like, yeah, one fight after the Mayweather fight. 
he fought a guy from, uh, I believe, Sweden. And then after that fight, we uh, we we was going to part ways. We had a big argument. And then uh, we stayed together for the fight because he was fighting Carlos Baldomir. And after the Carlos Baldomir fight, we went our separate ways. Did you go to his funeral? Yes, I went to his funeral, even though we wasn't speaking. You know, I mean, the day after the Baldomir fight was the last day we spoke. But I did go to his funeral. And who would you say, out of all of the fights that you've had, was the biggest learning fight for you? The fight that you, you went back to the dressing room and thought, I've got some work to do on myself here. When, when, I, when I had my first loss, I lost, a guy named Frankie, I, lost, I lost a guy, Frankie Warren, in Corpus Christi, Texas, July 1986. And after the fight, uh, my managers were upset. Family was all upset. And the, from the arena to the hotel was like a mile. So when we got outside the ho outside the arena, everybody like, come on, get in the car. I says, no, I'm, I'm going to walk to the hotel by myself. I don't want nobody to walk with me. I want to walk by myself. And my manager was like, get in the car. I'm like, no, I know what I'm doing. So I walked from the arena to the hotel. When I got to the hotel, I says, give me a fight. And he's like, what? I says, Just give me a fight. And that fight's behind me. I know what I got to do now. And that fight helped. It just made me understand that I need to make changes. And then I uh, started working with Hector Roca. God bless him. He's deceased now. I started working with Hector after that. And my first fight, they put me in with Saul Mamby, who was a former world champion. And people told me I was crazy to fight Saul Mamby because he was a spoiler. And coming off a loss, they says, you know, I lost to a guy five foot two, and I'm fighting a guy five foot nine. I said, man, look, it don't matter. When the bell rings, everybody's the same height. <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay. You know what I mean? And that fight was what really changed me and helped me become champion. And I lost to him in 86. Then, then December of 87, I got the call to fight him for the world title. In February of 88. So they called me in December. My manager says, you want to fight Frankie Warren for the vacant title? I said, hell yeah. He goes, there's one problem. I said, what's the problem? He goes, you got to go back to Texas. So I don't yeah. give a damn if I had to go to his mother's house. I want to fight him. I want the rematch. And the rematch was for the title. It was a 15-round fight. And I stopped him in the 12th. You know what I mean? So that fight with him was the fight that made me understand that, hey, you can't, even, you can't beat everybody the same way. You got to make changes. You know what I mean, and you got to make take a different approach to this if you want to be successful. You know I mean, so uh, sometimes that loss, that loss opens your eyes, and that loss opened my eyes. You know what I mean? So uh, and after that, you know what I mean. I mean, I was off and running. What a fantastic bit of advice! I've got to put this one up. Thank you for the five dollars. Uh, this is from Alexander Wilson. Can you ask Mr. McGirt about his legendary fights with Pernell Whitaker? And does he have any memories of Pernell that he'd like to share? What a very good question, Alexander. Okay, Alexander. The first fight with Pernell was, you know, kind of close. Second fight, he beat the hell out of me. But I will say this. This is my me greatest memory. And the second fight, I knocked him down. And when he got up, Whenever I knock a guy down, the first thing I do is look at their legs. When I got up, he was bouncing. I said, oh, shit, I'm in trouble. And when the referee said fight, said box, he walked straight to me and hit me with like 100 punches. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, shit. I said, I'm in trouble tonight. He went to work. After that, he went to work on me. I'm not going to lie. He beat my ass. I mean, right. after that, but then when I saw him jumping up, bouncing, then at one round he hit me with like, I said about sixty shots, and we got in the clinch. He was like, "Come on, buddy," I said, "I'm not going nowhere, Pete." I mean, I'm not going nowhere, and uh, 
But I will say that he's what he is the best fighter I've ever fought. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Hands down. He hit me some, some one time. I thought the referee was hitting me. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you mean there's punches coming from everywhere? Baby, this it was shit. It was like it sounded like a machine gun. Like oh, brr, brr, brr. I'm like, God damn. You know what I mean? Body shots, head up. I was like, shit. I couldn't get out the way. Yo, he was he that night he was just so sharp, man. Like everything was on point. He couldn't miss me if he tried. I mean, and he had a great trainer in his corner, Georgie Benton. Georgie Benton is one of the greatest trainers in boxing. Now, I have six losses. Four losses were the fighters trained by Georgie Benton. Ah, he studied you. Georgie, let's know. Georgie was the, yeah, he did. Georgie was the master, baby. Georgie Benton was, if, if fighters would watch him on tape, on YouTube, oh, Georgie Benton, unbelievable. Like that shoulder roll shit Mayweather's doing. Georgie was doing that back in the 50s. Oh, baby, you got to watch. If any young fighter is watching this podcast right now, watch George George Benton on YouTube, and they're going to say, the, on, the, on it, there's this thing that says, the master of the Philly shell. Georgie Benton goes to the ropes. Hurricane Carter throws eight punches at him and misses 10. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard his name, and it's probably because of that. To be fair, I do. Georgie Benton, him. he trained Evander Holyfield. You know what I mean, Pernell, George, this Georgie, Georgie was the man. Georgie Benton was the master. I'm telling you, he was one of the greatest trainers ever, and he would have been middleweight champ if he didn't get shot. He got shot, and that's what ended his career. But he became a trainer of many a champions. But no one talks about George. Everyone always says Lou Duva, Lou Duva. Bullshit. Lou Duva's not a trainer. Georgie Benton was the trainer. Not Lou. Georgie Benton trained those guys. And Pernell, and when I fought Pernell the first time, he came to me. Georgie's favorite word was motherfucker. That was his favorite word. And he said, look here, motherfucker. You almost ruined my masterpiece. He said Pernell was his masterpiece. He did an interview. He goes, motherfucker, you almost ruined my masterpiece. I said, George, I was trying. And he started laughing. He gave me a big hug and a kiss. And he said, I love you. But he used to always tell my mother, if I ever, if I train your son, he'll be undefeated. He actually approached your mom with that. Oh, yeah. I met him in 1983. No, I'm lying. 1982. I sparred with Johnny Bumpus in Toto, New Jersey. And he said, I want to, he, he said to my trainer, uh, I put him in for four rounds. After the second round, he told me to get out. So I got out the ring, and as I was getting dressed, he came over to me. He had a Miller beer in his hand. I'll never forget. Long, he had a Kango on and a Miller beer in his hand. He said, look here, you little motherfucker. How old are you? I said, I'm 18. He said, you're going to be a motherfucking champ, boy. You should let me train you. But Lou Duvin and him said, no. Because Lou Duvin and my manager, Al, Al Soto, didn't get along. They got along, but didn't get along. Okay. I mean, Lou Duva was like, no way. No way. Because Lou didn't want to do business with my manager out. I mean, so, um, but Georgie Ben used to, oh, he used to always tell my mother, he goes, if I train your son, he'd be undefeated. What I was Pernell Whitaker like outside the ring? Did you have any? I, I, I never really hung with him outside the ring, to be honest. Never did. Like, we see each other in passing, shake hands, say what's up, boom, boom, boom. You know what I mean? And, uh, um, God bless him, you know, but uh, never, I never, like outside, never, never conversated with him, like, or hung out with him, nothing like that. Were any fighters that you actually did get on that you fought? What, friends with? Yeah. Oh, I was friends with a lot of guys I fought. I, I didn't, I never had that, I hate that guy attitude. Nah. It's, it's business, baby, it's business. I mean, I mean, I mean, I, I, the more, we, to me, when I, the more relaxed I was in there, the better fighter I was. I mean, guys used to talk trash to me, but I didn't pay that shit no mind. I mean, you know, they have how their entourage. You mind? How'd you turn what? off? I'm oh, sorry to interrupt, but how, when someone's like giving you, giving you all the mouth, how'd you like just not listen to that and want to go and strangle them? <laughs> what kind of self control do you have to have to because be able to do that? You, you, you know why they're doing it. They're doing it to get under your skin, to take you out of character. So, why allow that? 
for what? I mean, you know, so I would let them talk, but it's like, okay. I mean, when the bell rings, you. Oh, his reception. Okay. Oh, I said, when the, when, when the bell rings, the entourage and the trainers take three steps down, you take three steps in. And it's just me and you. So you can talk all you want. You can talk trash. You know, it don't, it don't, it don't bother me. I mean, you know, it, it never did. I mean, when, even like today, when you get guys fighting, guys I'm fighting, talking trash, or, you know, people talking trash about me as a trainer, your fight is going to get knocked. I, I don't ignore. I ignore that. I don't get caught up in that. Being around for so many generations, buddy, would you say that the fighters of today are, 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 are different mentally to how they were when you guys were doing like your 15 rounds? You know, I, I, I would say this. There's a new generation of fighters that are coming up that I, I'm like, these kids are good. I mean, but prior it was, I, you know, I really, I really, it's hard to really, damn, it was just different. Everything was different. You know what I mean? You know, the, 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 the you know, Steve Kim is a, who's a reporter out of, uh, out of, uh, California. And he said that, uh, uh, fighters today don't fight enough. And I believe that. When was the last time you heard a world champion? a current world champion fighting a non-title fight in between title defenses. They don't do that no more. Mm -hmm. Back 70s, 80s, fighters did that. They, they stayed busy. You know, people say, why you have so many fights? So as a professional boxer, what do you do? I understand old. today guys are making tons of money. I understand that. And I respect that. You know what I mean? And then when they start making a certain amount of money, they don't want to take nothing less. But you got to keep your tools sharp. So instead of getting 10 million, you might get 5 million. But you keep keeping your tools sharp and you're making an extra 5 million. See, when I was fighting, a, a million dollars was like the jackpot. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So like 100 grand, it was like, what? 100,000? I fight I fight a whole family for 100,000. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like I took a fight once against a guy from a uh, scholar named Gary Jacobs. He was the number one uh, contender in the world. And they called me on seven days notice. I asked my manager how much they're paying. He said 50000 I said, I'll see you in the gym tomorrow. And my manager's like, are you crazy? I said, yo, we're taking that fight, man. I'm not giving up that fifty grand. Are you nuts? And I beat him. I mean, we started, I trained from Sunday to Friday. I sparred. Sunday to Friday, I sparred every day, and weighing was Saturday, and we fought Sunday in New York, and I beat him at the I beat him a unanimous decision, easiest fifty thousand I ever made. I told my manager, "You're gonna turn it down, but you want me to fight in two months for fifteen thousand? No, that's bad math." Yeah, for real. I could get this fifty thousand in five, six days. Let's take it. Fighters well, today don't do that. That's like the, I don't know, that's kind of like a risk taker's mentality where now there seems to be more business rather yeah, than. Yeah, it's more business fighting. now. Yeah. Now it's more business. It's more business now. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a lot of money out there now. Mm. Yeah, I mean, but that, that, that amount of money, do you think having more money makes fighters more content that they don't need to fight? more and i'm asking you this because you're a trainer you're involved with the fighters you'll have those business conversations you know what i mean it's hard to say because i don't know the the mentality is very different today it's uh, uh in the sense of how can i put it i'm trying to find the right words and i can't but they're okay fighting once every seven eight months they're okay yeah. with that Mm. You know what I mean, and and the and and so if they're okay with it, and the people around them are okay with it, it is what it is, you know. But I believe fighters should stay busy. What does it you take know? then? You've got a, you know, I'd say you've got a, a reasonably sized stable. It's not bursting at the seams. It's manageable. Uh, you can cope with who you've got in there. 
what does it take for you to say, yeah, I'll have you as a fighter? Because I'm sure to God you must turn some people down. I I I um I like first thing I like to do is I, I tell any fighters, let's work a couple of days just to see if we click. You'd know after a not, couple of days, buddy. Not just click in the gym, click outside the gym. So we'll train, we'll hang out, go to lunch, go to dinner, kick it for a couple of days and see if we can vibe each other. We both, you should know by then, if you know that me and this guy could get along for five or six weeks, but well, we can't because you can have all the talent in the world and we might get along inside the gym, but outside the gym, we might not or vice versa. We might get, you know what I'm saying? So I, I believe that you got to have that, that bond in and outside the gym. You know what I mean? You don't want the negative in either way to, to pull over into a fight. You know, it's fight night and you say, you know what the hell with this? I ain't telling them shit or I don't get, you know, you, you never know what a person thinks. So me personally, I tell each fighters, you know, like, you know, like I had a guy says, well, how much is it going to cost me? I said, well, let's spend a couple of days together first. I'm not going to give you a price. I don't want to take your money if we don't get along because then I'm going to hate going to the gym training you and you're going to hate me coming to the gym to train you. So how much, if we don't get along, how much am I going to get out of you and how much are you going to get out of me? So if there's no, if there's, if, if there's no, no vibe there, well, you know what I mean? You know, when, when she, you know, it's crazy. When Chisora called me, right? I said, look, man, let's work a couple of days. He said, okay. He flew me out to, he flew me out to, to the UK. He agreed with me. He goes, I like that, buddy. And we worked a few days and we got along great. And we still do to this day. He calls me all the time to check on me. But especially when I'm in the UK, he checks on me at least once a week. No matter where I'm in the UK, he calls me and says, you're okay. That's my man, Chisora. That's my man. Even Dylan. Dylan calls me when I'm in the UK, when he's in Portugal, he calls me at least twice a week to see if I'm okay. And if he sees something on Instagram don't look right, Dylan's on the phone right away. So, you know, they're great guys, you know, both of them. Both of them are great guys. Speaking of Dillian, what's happening with him? Have you? I know you said you speak to him on a personal level, but what what what, what is happening? Are you still his trainer? Is that still okay? What's oh yeah, it's still open. He's just right now. He said he's waiting for some news. He said he'll let me know, and then he's gonna make an announcement. So I'm like, okay, no problem. Yeah, because I know I'd get heavily criticised as I did last time for not asking you about um, what's happening with um, Dillian. Um, we can also touch on uh, Dan Aziz. Obviously, Dan Aziz goes into fight Joshua Boatsy, third uh, of February. How's that going? Well, to be honest, I've worked with Dan two weeks. He's been in London working with uh, Larry. I can't pronounce Larry's last name. Are you not? So, are you not training him anymore then? Yeah, but you know what? He 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 knew I was in Liverpool. But he, he elected to stay in in London. And then the last two weeks he came, these last two weeks he came to to Liverpool and stayed. But before that, he was training with Larry and he's working with Larry now. Like I speak to him, you know, when the days that he spawned, he calls me, they send me video. I mean, but Larry's training him right now. I don't know who Larry is. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll leave that one there. But what we can do then on a final note, how does this fight go on Saturday? How does Callum Smith beat the Russian, the Russian Canadian Artem Beterbiev? We have to uh, um, get his respect and then go from there. We like it. Listen, guys, thank you for all of you that have tuned in, that have took your time out. It's another short notice one with me today, but. As you can see, Buddy and I, and I think you'll agree with me, Buddy, we get on quite well. We can talk boxing for hours. Oh, yeah. oh yes. All it's, day, every day. It, you can't, I think, I think with me, I like to learn off those that have, like, done the walk. You've, you've had 80 fights. You said to me that even at the beginning, you always knew you was going to be a coach. So that was always the end goal. So you've gone through all of your boxing career, all of those fights, and then you've ended up 
where you want to be. There's fighters that would have had a successful career like yourself and they can't string a sentence together. You know, unfortunately, they've had health issues or maybe they've, you know, squandered their money, ended up on the wrong side of the road. But you're here and you're still, you know, you put that energy into training today's fighters and it's admirable. Uh, it's it's always a pleasure and an honor to have you as a guest body. And Thank honestly, you. I wish you nothing but the best on Saturday. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Do you know what I mean? So, guys, please follow Buddy over on Instagram. It's his posts are interesting. He'll show you little bits that he does with his fighters. Uh, and he always puts up common sense quotes uh, in his stories. And I look at them and I think, yep, yeah, I can relate to that. Yep, yeah, I can relate to that. <laughs> but, yeah, Buddy, listen, I'm going to let you go. Um, but, yeah, I'll, I'll be watching Saturday anyway. Okay. So I'll, I'll send you a message after the fight. All right, thank you. Take Appreciate care. it. All right. And you. <laughs> Bye -bye. All right.